allosteric regulation, first off, it can be positive, it can be negative. So an allosteric regulator doesn't have to inhibit, it can actually turn, um, can actually turn enzymes on as well. Um, the basic definition of the allosteric is the same. You have an event, usually something binding to um, the enzyme at a site other than the active site. There's a confirmation change and it causes the active site to change. So if we look at this enzyme, the first thing you notice as soon as we're talking about something that's allosteric, we've got two different binding sites. You need two binding sites. One is the active site where the substrate's going to bind. The other is a binding site where the regulator, the inhibitor, or the activator can bind. So just like with the hemoglobin, something binds over here. And what you should be looking at here is that when this binds, the active site changed shape. If we were looking at allosteric inhibition, the change in the active site shape would prevent the substrate from binding. If you were looking at allosteric activation, then the change in the shape would be um, <coughs> the correct shape now, and it would allow the substrate to bind. So that's activation, correct? Um, could be either. Um, so think about it this way. So let's say that's your substrate. So so here it doesn't quite fit. So then let's say the inhibitor binds and it causes Pac-Man to open its mouth up wider. Now the substrate can fit. It could have also been the other way around. Um, so again, if we continue with our Pac-Man, if the inhibitor causes Pac-Man to open its mouth up, then it's activation if the inhibitor actually caused it to close its mouth more. So let's say what's the term that you said the regulator is either an inhibitor or a activator. So now the inhibitor actually made the mouth close more. That would be an inhibition. I think you got the concept, but I'm going to change that to regulator because an inhibitor just wouldn't activate. So the, the, the main point from here is this concept that this can be positively or negatively regulated. I, I think everyone gets into talking about enzyme regulation. You know, you learn about feedback inhibition in all of your other classes. Most of them don't ever talk about feed-forward activation. It, it can go in both directions. Um, okay, so if we talk about um, if we talk about competitive versus non-competitive, again, if you look at this. There are a couple differences that will make it fairly easy to tell one from the other. If we look at this competitive um, inhibition, the first thing to look at is if you look at that part of each of the molecule that I've highlighted, what do you notice about that, about them? They're the same in both molecules. Why are they the same? Because they're both binding to the same site. If we talked about a substrate enzyme interaction and we said that the substrate had to fit correctly into the active site, if the inhibitor is going to bind in the active site, it also has to fit correctly. And so the substrate and the inhibitor will look similar 
if you have competitive inhibition. They have to look similar because they're trying to fit into the same place. Um, you can tell which one of these is happening by certain features um, of, the, of the inhibition. And when I say here that adding enough substrate will overcome the effects of the inhibitor, um, what exactly do I mean by that? So let's say you've got two scenarios. So you've got your you've got your enzyme. And you've got some inhibitors. Let's say that Are your substrates. In this situation, you've got a 50-50 chance of inhibitor or substrate binding, right? Because you've got three inhibitors, three substrates, they're all going to try to bind there. But what if I change this scenario and I add more substrate? What have I just done to the chances of the inhibitor being able to bind? I've lowered them. So you could keep on with this, and you would reach a point that you added so much substrate that the inhibitors have essentially been made pointless because there's just so much substrate that you've got such a higher probability that the substrate's going to bind. Um, and so that's what I mean by this comment. If we look at non-competitive inhibition, the first thing to look at here is A, we're talking about two sites. So someone here usually wonders, isn't non-competitive really the same thing as allosteric? It is. I, I get the feeling that the two concepts were kind of developed in parallel at the same time without knowing that two different groups were working on the same thing. Um, we talked about allosteric, um, and everything we talked about there is going to apply here as well. Um, but in the comparison between this and competitive, again, you've got two sites. One of them is your active site. Here, one of two things can happen. Either the substrate gets to the active site first, and we've got green for go. The enzyme here is active. Or the inhibitor gets there first, and it turns the enzyme off. One of the biggest differences between competitive and non-competitive Both I and S can bind at the same time. However, just because the substrate can bind doesn't mean the enzyme is active. So if you look here, the shape is different. So even though S binds to both, so even though S can bind to both, um, the enzyme with the inhibitor is still not active it's still been inhibited. So um, competitive, straightforward. Whatever gets to the site first controls what's happening. The substrate gets there, it's active. If the inhibitor gets there, it's inactive. The same thing happens here, except here the inhibitor doesn't necessarily prevent the substrate 
from occupying that active site, but the inhibitor does always turn the enzyme off. If it didn't turn the enzyme off, it wouldn't be in inhibition. So, um, so can 